speaker is uh, Gadi Lisak, uh, and this is the first time psychologist, yeah? Yes. <laughs> okay, great. So, it's your stage, please. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Hello, and uh, I'm good with the sound. Hello, and thank you for inviting me to this conference. Uh, I'm a clinical and behavioral medicine psychologist, and uh, I've been in, um, collecting data from the field, from studies, for about six or so years, or seven years now, about all the risks um, that screens are uh, involving. And I want to tell you today about all the other risks except uh, I will mention radiation, but there are many other risks. And I will um, broadly overview, overview uh, not so much scientific heavy data, but how are things going in Israel? What do psychologists uh, see actually in the field when they meet children with excessive screen time? Actually, the I used to say a few years ago, I used to, say, used to present how many hours uh, children are using uh, screens and there is the, there are light users and heavy users. Actually today, all the, children's, the children are heavy users. You just leave them with a the phone and easily they'll exceed five, six hours a day, if not more. Um, so let me begin um, with, now it's not working. It used to work. Oh, okay. No, it's on. Now it's not working. Anyway, it froze. Let's see. No, this is frozen. This way it works. Okay. Okay. So um, I lecture to parents. Not many are interested in lectures. They actually, and I will go over that at the end of the lecture, what are the difficulties with parents today, which are the major factor if you wanna, we want to make any change in this field. Um, and um, I mentioned to uh, parents the question, how do screens actually have any influence, this nice gadget, how does it influence their child? And many, many of them still do not know. So there is the bright light of the screen, there is the intensity of this, the colors, there. it's actually advancing every, all the time, become, becoming more and more intense. The ultraviolet light, and radiation, and then there are fast-paced stimulation, multiple windows open, The children are receiving uh, Let me just go over that to silence that. So when you see all those screens together, the fast-paced stimulation, the intensity of the colors, um, the bright light, all that throughout the day is waking up the system. That's in a non-scientific term. It's actually making the children hyperactive. Uh, the sympathetic uh, system is uh, over flooded, 
And one of th I want to go over th major three consequences. One of them is sleep. So when the child or adolescent closes the, do close closes the door behind them at night, and the, ch the parents are all um, rested and calm, but actually this is what's going on there. So. Um, I'll, I'll go over it in a minute, just, just one second. So the child actually is uh, busy with the phone because the phone became, the, they have a mobile gadget. Uh, this is one of the things that m changed in the last three or four years that uh, studies realized that the children are taking the media with them to their room and it's uh, affecting sleep uh, because of the bright light mainly. We're not sure about the radiation. There are studies that say that it affects uh, sleep. Um, the daily screen time is, uh, there is a uh, formula that one hour of screen time affects 10 minutes of sleep. It can decrease sleep and it also can affect the quality of sleep. So children, children can uh, become more tired because they're quality of sleep is reduced or the time of sleep is shortened. And as I mentioned, uh, they're aroused sympathetically, so they have difficulty to fall asleep. Um, the, one of the major issues here is screen time just before bedtime. And um, the recommendation is not to have any screens at least one hour or two hours, depending on the age, before sleep time. And I said that the screens are now in the children's rooms. There's also, there are also televisions and some have the computer in the room. It's very difficult to control. Another aspect is that studies show now, or for a couple of years already, that there are areas in the brain the change, and they are related to, um, now this is actually, uh, you can see how this field is evolving because this is quite not up an updated slide because it's talking about internet games and addiction when the internet, when the ga internet time and games, when the games were only offline. Now it's online, so internet and games have merged to one thing. And over six hours of use, we see changes in uh, the frontal lobe functioning, a decrease in con cognitive control, and shrinkage or loss uh, of tissue uh, in that part of the, the brain. And it affects a few uh, capabilities, psychological capabilities. One of them is empathy. Uh, the ability to detect uh, errors in conflict when they're happening, and um, there is more aggression, aggressive behavior, and impulsivity. And at this point, when I show this to parents, I ask them, let's just pause from that for a second and think about um, uh, cyberbullying. What does a child need inside of them? What characteristics they need to be a cyberbully? And if you look, they need to be less empathic. They, if they will not detect the conflict they're entering at, the, at a certain moment with another person online, and they're more aggressive and impulsive, they're more, more likely to be a cyber bully, which means that we're actually setting the grounds gradually for children to become, to more likely become cyber bullies because this is what's happening in their brains. It's also decision-making decision which is decreased. And there is a positive correlation between internet use time and cyberbullying. Let me go over another major uh, influence um, which is, uh, relates to ADHD. Um, so we know that children with ADHD, they like fast-paced, interactive stimulation through the screens. And the question is why? And how does it relate to our topic here? So uh, 
when we know that fast-paced stimulation increases dopamine secretion, which makes a good feeling, that's, it comes with dopamine. So that's, that explains why children are actually addicted, one of the explanations, addicted to screen time. They just feel better. And when the screen is taken away from them, the flow of dopamine is just cut off, and they feel this emptiness. And then, because their brain is already over, over activated, they might become, uh, you might see a rage attack because their video game was taken away from them. They're actually in a fight mode, and the flow of uh, this high feeling is taken away from them uh, instantly, just abruptly, and then you see rage attacks. Um, some receptors might, dopamine, there is a, uh, an argument that says that eventually the dopamine receptors are overworked and they might decrease uh, their um, activity and then the children will turn to more screen time, more stimulation, and more stimulation, stimulating uh, hopefully the dopamine secretion more. Uh, so we see actually the same, um, uh, the screens are um, uh, making the system work as the same as in addictive uh, sub substance, substance uh, addiction. We know, I mentioned that chronic sleep is one of the effects, so combined with the dopamine addiction, and chronic sleep we will, and shortening of attention span because the fast-paced stimulation um, makes the brain be uh, ad uh, adjusted to very short uh, length of, uh, the stimulation is very, is very short, it's, very, it's changing. I mean, it's less than two seconds. A good commercial is always changing less than two or three seconds, because everybody will become bored. I used to show all of you here in the room should remember that uh, like 30, 40 years ago, there was this black clock before the news in Israel, and used to move very slowly for 30 seconds. Now, who would stand that today? So the children are, their brain is changing. It's actually changing uh, right in front of us and their attention span is shortening. So you combine all this together, you actually receive ADHD-like symptoms. And the important word here is like, which means they're not organically um, having ADHD necessarily, but they will be diagnosed more very likely as ADHD, uh, as having ADHD, and referred to treatments, and um, which the treatments might, might not be useful because all we need is to take away the screens and in a minute I'll show you a case study which I did that. Uh, some children, so this circle of addiction begins in the screens but it can also start with children who are already with some inclination to ADHD and they are drawn to the fast-paced stimulation and this circle is strengthened and reworked again. So this is a case study of a nine-year-old who came to my clinic and the parent said um, he was diagnosed with uh, ADHD. Uh, this is channel, it was channel two back then, uh, made a short um, article on the, on the child. Uh, they said, they told me he's, uh, he's, uh, AD, he's, he di he's diagnosed with ADHD, he's a lot with the screens, so I already, you know, place that in the back of my mind when I uh, heard that. I'm working with biofeedback. They came for biofeedback. The internet, in the internet it says that biofeedback is good for ADHD. Frankly, I do not say that immediately to parents, but I'm not sure where that came from. It's not very useful for ADHD. But I listen to the parents and they say he's aggressive in school. The school wants actually to kick him uh, out. Uh, we don't know what to do with him. He's, uh, he was, why did they come to me? Because he was underweight after uh, Ritalin, taking Ritalin for a long time. 
So, uh, this is the child, he had uh, screens in his room, his phone, a, a huge screen this size in one of the, you see that screen, uh, for, uh, uh, for lectures, but he had that, he played his games on that screen, very violent games. Um, and then the 90% of what I did to him is a gradual pro a program of gradually decreasing screen time. And he became much better in school. And he was he gained his weight back. He, he after a three to eleven weeks, he was in normal weight, and his behavior was normal in school. And that shows us that probably, I don't know the number of children which might be in the same uh, condition or situation. All we need is to take away the screens and not invest in time-consuming and um, money-consuming treatments which not, m might not do anything because at the same time the child is consuming screen time, which is working against any treatment that we might uh, send the child to. So what do psychologists and other clinicians, what do they see uh, when children come to them? They see a dysregulated child. And that is physically, and I uh, will go over this quickly, we see more obese children, we see physical weakness, uh, headaches, which are, uh, might be related, uh, some studies uh, claims that the light in the morning as we wake up, and we, so many, of course, people right, turn right away to, this, to this, the cell phone, the abrupt uh, stream of light create, is related to headaches. There's, of course, the uh, uh, compromised vision. It's now uh, been declared that um, um, vision is not only a ca um, caused by her hereditary. It's uh, actually an environmental uh, disease um, now. Now, orthopedic problems also exist in the wrists and in posture. And there is a compromised immune system because the uh, melatonin is not is dysregulated because it's, the sleep is dysregulated. And then there is sleep disorders that I mentioned, and hypertension and cortisol dysregulation are also um, uh, mentioned in studies. On the neurological uh, side, we s might see children with tics. Uh, for example, a 15-year-old child came to me and um, he, was, he had um, exam anxiety, anxiety over exams, and tics. So who should we send him to, to a neurologist or a psychologist? So I did uh, relaxation techniques and screen time reduction and both improved. Um, Learning, and uh, we see a late language development and memory and com concentration are also compromised. Um, school achievements might go up at, at, until a certain level, but too much screens in school might uh, compromise them. And then there are the areas where I mentioned that we know that the brain is changing, the cognitive behavioral uh, aspect, and we see all those um, uh, behaviors and characteristics involved. What do you mean by digital dementia? Well, uh, you don't need to remember anything anymore, right? It's everything is there. You don't need to know directions. You don't need to to find your way. You don't need to remember anything. So it's all in, in you know, on, in your in the gadgets, and um, uh, this ability might be useful to collect to retrieve information when I don't have it readily under my, my uh, you know, in my hand. Um, socially, children are less empathic and might not be interested in any other activities that are not involving screens. Emotionally, the important uh, aspect here is depressive behavior and self-harm and suicidal behavior. It's really a tall that uh, screens are 
um, implementing on, on us. Um, every child might, might show a different combination of these symptoms, and this would cause confusion for parents because they won't know that it's even related to screens. And um, they might um, and they might not go to any any clinician. They might not know that they have to treat the aggressive child or the less sympathetic child or may, or headaches or any other symptoms that might occur. One of the last things I want to mention about to mention is uh, where are we heading to in the sense of the resilience of the next generation? So we have now the generation <coughs> Z, which is now entering the work the workforce. And we might not see the real impact because those are entering now the workforce. They were 10 years old at the year 2010 when tablets and phones really began to penetrate our society. They were already, so they had 10 years of growing up, let's say more normal or with less screens. It's very significant. But we will see this with children who are growing now with screens all around them. So there will be um, um, physically, you see this list of physical uh, uh, results of, um, uh, and, um, and then there is a psychophysiological uh, outcomes that I mentioned. And the interpersonal skill is another pillar of the psychophysiological resilience. We have psychophysiological, interpersonal, and in that aspect, the time with the parents is also decreasing, which is very important for them to build interpersonal skills for future relationships. And for them, time is screen time. There is no time for themselves with themselves. And they're not, they don't know what's to be bored, and uh, which is called, in Hebrew you see dead time, or I don't know, the time that you wait in the, in the, for the, in the bank or whatever, used to, people just used to stand and stare. At, that, at those times, at those, in this, uh, uh, in such times, the brain is processing all, all that it needs to process unconsciously. But now it cannot do it because the brain is occupied with the screens. So um, there will be less decreased ability to contain any negative thoughts and emotions. And they might sometimes cross a threshold for the future generation and be more of a threat to them because they're not used to process them automatically at those boring times. Because of that, they uh, will probably be with less coping skills and with less interpersonal skills to um, face challenges. And we might expect an overload in the health and mental systems uh, because of that. Now, one last thing is what's happening in Israel. So this is not happening too much. It's classes where they put away their phones. The Ministry of Education uh, is actually uh, still aspiring um, very eagerly to um, that will children will be kind of a digital uh, citizens. That's a term was used in one of their papers. Um, while we know already that for the 21st century we need creativity, we need interpersonal skills, we need problem solving skills, and much less of uh, um, digital skills. It's, they're easy to be picked up later. You don't make the, your, uh, your, the cyber startup because you, uh, you used to play video games for 10 years. So you don't need that to be on social networks. Don't make people uh, un entrepreneurs in the digital uh, area. So this is not happening enough. It relate, it, um, and it depends on, on parents' initiative. There is a group of two, uh, two um, women, uh, very busy mothers, who formed a group which is uh, translated as uh, let us grow on silent, which means silent mode, the phone silent mode. 
and they are actually um, forming groups of parents that will buy for the children um, simple phones. In terms of radiation, I know in Amir sometimes consult them. It's not a perfect solution, but in terms of all the other risks, it, it, it's, it is. But also in terms of radiation, because if there's less screen time, they might be less near this gadget. So this is happening, and this is what probably one of the only initiatives which is changing um, things in Israel. Uh, one last thing is... They're already there, kind of generation Y, and that's, that's how they communicate. Um, so the children cannot go to sleep early enough just because of that. And I'm not mentioning the difficulty of limiting screens in schools, which I said the Ministry of Education is eagerly pushing to implement them. And I believe, so, and I mentioned to use a simple phone, and thank you for listening. People who have uh, violent criminal records or have uh, kids who are juvenile delinquents and link that, is there a clear association with cell phone usage? Has there ever been a study to prove this empirically or is this just sort of an inclination? Because I didn't see any actual, I mean, it seemed like a, a psychologist's impression rather than a, a social science experiment. Well, there, are some, there is some data linking uh, violent content in the media to uh, late, uh, later, uh, like 10, 15 years later, uh, with violent behavior. So there is some data, yes. I don't know if with criminals, but that I don't know of. Um, I have a, a nine-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a six-year-old. And before I started suffering from electrohypersensitivity some two and a half years ago, uh, I was a very, very poor example uh, as a parent uh, with my cell phone addiction. And I was wondering what arguments did you find successful with addicted parents to, to be a better example at home themselves? Well, uh, there is a slide with the, in the longer uh, lecture that uh, I go, eventually I had to develop uh, uh, an approach for parents themselves to overcome their resistance. First, I, I came to parents and I said, you know, it, there is, you'll, there, your children become obese and with, high, and with hypertension. And I thought that would be convincing enough. Of course, it didn't convince any, any parent. So the parents, I have more of what is, uh, why parents are resisting. And through this a discussion around that, maybe it will change them. I tell them that their child will not, everyone wants them now not a doctor or a lawyer, they want them to uh, be, to make an exit, you know, entrepreneur and, you know, make an exit. So I tell them that they do not, as I said, they do not, do not need to be 10 hours with video games and social networks to become that. Actually, that will may decrease their ability to become that. So that's one thing. But parents are, in a way, anxious or afraid that they are, um, what's the word, they are taking away from their children some abilities. So they need to be with screens. If they will go to an, uh, some schools, 
that uh, limits screens, they might not be ready for the tw 21st century. And they are quite, actually, it's quite the opposite. So that's, that's the parents' approach. It's not easy to change the parents' behavior. It's very difficult. They're with phones. Or, yes, that's, that's part of the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dean.